Mr. McCoy back with part eight of Bridge to Terabithia. As you recall, Jess was talking to Joyce Ann and said, Old Santa knows the way. He don't need a chimney, does he, Maybell? Maybell was watching him with her big solemn eyes. Jess gave her a knowing wink over Joyce Ann's head. Nah, Joyce Ann, he knows the way. He knows everything. She squinched up her right cheek in a vain effort to return his wink. She was a good kid. He really liked old Maybell. The next morning, he helped her dress and undress her Barbie at least 30 times. Slithering the skinny dress over the doll's head and arms and snapping the tiny fasteners was more than her chubby six-year-old fingers could manage. He had received a racing car set, which he tried to run to please his father. It wasn't one of those big sets that they advertised on TV, but it was electric, and he knew his dad had put more money into it than he should have. But the silly cars kept falling off at the curves until his father was cursing at them with impatience. Jess wanted it to be okay. He wanted so much for his dad to be proud of his present the way he, Jess, had been proud of the puppy that he had given to Leslie. It's really great, really. I just ain't got the hang of it yet. His face was red and he kept shoving his hair back out of his eyes as he leaned over the plastic figure eight track. Cheap junk. His father kicked at the floor dangerously near the track. Don't get nothing for your money these days. Joyce Ann was lying on her bed screaming because she had yanked the string out of her talking doll and it was no longer talking. Brenda had her lips stuck out because Ellie had gotten a pair of pantyhose and her Christmas stocking and she had only gotten bobby socks. Ellie wasn't helping matters, prancing around in her new hose, making a big show of helping Mama with the ham and sweet potatoes for dinner. Lord, sometimes Ellie was as snotty as Wanda K. Moore. Jesse Oliver Aarons Jr., if you can stop playing with those fool cars long enough to melt the cow, I'd be most appreciative. Miss Bessie, don't take no holiday, even if you do. Jesse jumped up, pleased for an excuse to leave the track, which he couldn't make work to his father's satisfaction. His mother seemed not to notice the promptness of his response, but went on in a complaining voice. I don't know what I'd do without Ellie. She's the only one of you kids ever cares whether I live or die. Ellie smiled like a plastic angel, first at Jess and then at Brenda, who glared back. Leslie must have been watching for him because as soon as he started across the yard, he could see her running out of the old Perkins place, the puppy half tripping her as it chased her circles around her. They met at Miss Bessie's shed. I thought you'd never come out this morning. Yeah, well, Christmas, you know. Prince Tureen began to snap at Miss Bessie's hooves. She stamped in annoyance. Leslie picked him up so Jess could milk. The puppy squirmed and licked, making it almost impossible for her to talk. She giggled happily. Dumb dog, she said proudly. Yeah, it felt like Christmas again. When have you ever given a gift to someone and that someone truly appreciated that gift? Share what happened with your fellow listener. Mr. Burke had begun to repair the old Perkins place. After Christmas, Mrs. Burke was right in the middle of writing a book, so she wasn't available to help, which left Leslie the jobs of hunting and fetching. For all his smartness with politics and music, Mr. Burke was inclined to be absent-minded. He would put down the hammer to pick up the how-to book and then lose the hammer between there and the project he was working on. Leslie was good at finding things for him, and he liked her company as well. When she came home from school and on the weekends, he wanted her around. Leslie explained all of this to Jess. Jess tried going to Terabithia alone, but it was no good. It needed Leslie to make the magic work. He was afraid he would destroy everything by trying to force the magic on his own when it was plain that the magic was reluctant to come for him. If he went home, either his mother was after him to do some chore or Maybelle wanted them to play Barbie. Lord, he wished a million times he'd never helped buy that stupid doll. He'd no more than lie down on the floor to paint than Maybelle would come after him to put an arm back on or snap up a dress. Joyce Ann was worse. She got a devilish delight out of sitting smack down on his rump when he was stretched out working. If he yelled at her to get the heck off of him, she'd stick her index finger in the corner of her mouth and holler. 
which would, of course, crank up his mother. Jesse Oliver, you leave that baby alone. What you mean lying there in the middle of the floor doing nothing anyway? Didn't I tell you I couldn't cook supper before you chopped wood for the stove? Sometimes he would sneak down to the old Perkins place and find Prince Tureen crying on the porch where Mr. Burke had exiled him. You couldn't blame the man. No one could get anything done with that animal grabbing his hand or jumping up to lick his face. He'd take P.T. for a romp in the Burke's upper field. If it was a mild day, Miss Bessie would be moving nervously from across the field. She couldn't seem to get used to the yipping and snapping, or maybe it was that time of year. Uh, the last dregs of winter spoiling the taste of everything. Nobody, human or animal, seemed happy. Except Wesley. She was crazy about fixing up that broken down old wreck of a house. She loved being needed by her father. Half the time they were supposed to be working, they were just yakking away. She was learning she related glowingly at recess to understand her father. It never occurred to Jess that parents were meant to be understood any more than the safe at the Millsburg First National was sitting around begging him to crack it. Parents were what they were. It wasn't up to you to try to puzzle them out. Uh, there was something weird about a grown man wanting to be friends with his own child. He ought to have friends his own age and let her have hers. Jess's feelings about Leslie's father poked up like a canker sore. You keep biting it and it gets bigger and worse instead of better. You spend a lot of your time trying to keep your teeth away from it. Then sure as Christmas you forget the silly thing and chomp right down on it. Lord, that man got in his way. It even poisoned what time he did have with Leslie. She'd be sitting there bubbling away at recess and it would be almost like the old times. Then, without warning, she say, Bill thinks so-and-so, chump, right down on the old sword. Finally, finally, she noticed. It took her until February, and for a girl as smart as Leslie, that was a long, long time. Why don't you like Bill? Who said I didn't? Jess Aarons, how stupid do you think I am? Well, pretty stupid, sometimes. But what he actually said was, uh, what makes you think I don't like him? Well, you never come to the house anymore. At first I thought it was something I'd done, but it's not that. You still talk to me at school. Lots of times I see you in the field playing with PT, but you don't even come near the door. You're always busy. He was uncomfortably aware of how much he sounded like Brenda when he said this. Well, for spaghetti sauce, you could offer to help, you know. It was like all the lights coming back on after an electrical storm. Lord, who was the stupid one? Still, it took him a few days to feel comfortable around Leslie's father. Part of the problem was he didn't know what to call him. Hey, he'd say, and both Leslie and her father would turn around. Uh, M Mr. Burke, I wish you'd call me Bill, Jess. Yeah, he fumbled around with the name for a couple more days, but it came more easily with practice. It also helped to know some things that Bill, for all his brains and books, didn't know. Jess found he was really useful to him, not a nuisance to be tolerated or set out on the porch, like P.T. Do you feel like Jess does that it's hard to call an adult by his or her first name? Share with your fellow listener. You're amazing, Bill would say. Where did you learn that, Jess? Jess never quite knew how he knew things, so he'd shrug and let Bill and Leslie praise him to each other, though the work itself was praise enough. First, they ripped out the boards that covered the ancient fireplace, coming upon the rusty bricks like prospectors upon the mother load. Next, they got the old wallpaper off the living room wall, all five garish layers of it, Sometimes, as they lovingly patched and painted, they listened to Bill's records, or they sang. Leslie and Jess teaching Bill some of Miss Edmund's songs, and Bill teaching them some he knew. At other times, they would talk. Jess listened wonderingly as Bill explained things that were going on in the world. If Mama could hear him, she'd swear he was another 
uh, Walter Cronkite instead of some hippie. All the Burks were smart. Not smart maybe about fixing things or growing things, but smart in a way Jess had never known real live people to be. Like one day while they were working, Judy came down and read out loud to them, mostly poetry and some of it in Italian, which of course Jess couldn't understand at all. But he buried his head in the rich sound of the words and let himself be wrapped warmly around in the feel of the Burke's brilliance. They painted the living room gold. Leslie and Jess had wanted blue, but Bill held out for gold, which turned out to be so beautiful that they were glad they had given in. The sun would slant in from the west in the late afternoon until the room was brimful of light. Finally, Bill rented a sander from Millsburg Plaza and they took off the black floor paint down to the white oak boards and refinished them. No rugs, Bill said. No, agreed Judy. It would be like putting a veil on the Mona Lisa. When Bill and the children had finished razor blading the last bits of paint off the windows and washed the panes, they called Judy down from her upstairs study to come and see. The four of them sat down on the floor and gazed around. It was gorgeous. Leslie gave a deep, satisfied sigh. I love this room, she said. Don't you feel the golden enchantment of it? It is worthy to be. Jess looked up in sudden alarm in a palace. Relief. In such a mood, a person might even let a sworn secret slip. But she hadn't, not even to Bill and Judy, and he knew how she felt about her parents. She must have seen his anxiety because she winked at him across Bill and Judy, just as he sometimes winked at Maybelle over Joyce Ann's head. Terabithia was still just for the two of them. The next afternoon, they called P.T. and headed for Terabithia. It had been more than a month since they had been there together, and as they neared the creek bed, they slowed down. Jess wasn't sure he still remembered how to be a king. We've been away for many years, Leslie was whispering. How do you suppose the kingdom has fared in our absence? Where have we been? Conquering the hostile savages in our northern borders, she answered. But the lines of communication have been broken, and thus we do not have tidings of our beloved homeland for many a full moon. How was that for regular queen talk? Jess wished he could match it. You think anything bad has happened? We must have courage, my king. It may indeed be so. They swung silently across the creek bed. On the farther bank, Leslie picked up two sticks. Thy sword, sire, she said. Just nodded. They hunched down and crept toward the stronghold like police detectives on TV. Hey, queen, watch out. Behind you. Leslie whirled and began to duel the imaginary foe. Then more came rushing upon them and the shouts of the battle rang through Terabithia. The guardian of the realm raced about in happy puppy circles, too young as yet to comprehend the danger that surrounded them all. They have sounded the retreat, the brave queen cried. Yay! Drive them out utterly so they may never return and prey upon our people. Out you go! Out! Out! All the way to the creek bed, they forced the enemy back, sweating under their winter jackets. At last! Terabithia is free once more. The king sat down on a log and wiped his face, but the queen did not let him rest long. Sire, we must go at once to the grove of the pines and give thanks for our victory. Just followed her into the grove where they stood silently in the dim light. Who do we thank? He whispered. The question flickered across her face. Oh, God, she began. She was more at home with magic than religion. Oh, uh, spirits of the grove, thy right arm hast given us the victory. He couldn't remember where he'd heard that one, but it seemed to fit. Leslie gave him a look of approval. She took up the words. Now grant protection to Terabithia, to all its people, and to us, its rulers. Aroo! Jess tried hard not to smile, and to its puppy dog and to Prince Tureen, its guardian and jester. Amen. Amen. 
They both managed somehow to keep the giggles buttoned in until they got out of the sacred place. A few days after the encounter with the enemies of Terabithia, they had an encounter of a different sort at school. Leslie came out at recess to tell Jess that she had started into the girls' room only to be stopped by the sound of crying from one of the stalls. She lowered her voice. This sounds crazy, she said, but from the feet, I'm sure it's Janice Avery in there. What do you think's gonna happen now? Share with your fellow listener. Just a little more remains, a bridge to Terabithia. You're kidding. The picture of Janice Avery crying on the toilet seat was too much for Jess to imagine. Well, she's the only one in school that has Willard Hughes' name crossed out on her sneakers. Besides, the smoke is so thick in there, you need a gas mask. Are you sure she was crying? Jess Aarons, I can tell if somebody's crying or not. We'll find out more about what's happening with Janice Avery and other interesting tidbits as Bridge to Terabithia continues.